Hello, critics, non-critics, and friends. Welcome to the Film Optics Podcast, brought to you by the Drive-In Podcast Network, where we discuss film, TV, and all things Hollywood here on the show. I'm your host, Christian, and I'm joined by friends of the show. We have J.D. Duran from In Session Film, and we have Matt Wyatt from Twitter. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where you'll find me. That's the only place you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> and today we are going to be continuing our celebration of 20 years of magic with our harry potter movie series uh with the review of the order of the phoenix aka one of the most underrated harry potter movies out there and before mm. we begin today's show you can listen to our podcast on platforms around the internet if you're a new or seasoned listener to the show we would love to hear from you guys follow us on twitter and instagram FM optics that is optics with an X. So JD, how are you doing, man? It's it's it's, it's nice to have you back. You reached yep. out, you're like, mm-hmm. have me on for Order of the Phoenix. I'm like, yep, you got it. <laughs> how yeah, you been? I I somewhat demanded to be here for this episode. <laughs> so thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Uh, being a part of the first episode in the series was. A treat, of course, listening to the episode since then has been a lot of fun, but yeah, we had to get down to some brass tacks. I had yeah. to, had to be here to talk about this movie. <laughs> Much so I'm, like I'm I like, I for I was like, Hey, um, can I come on for uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lord of the Rings? Yeah, like, exactly. I, like, I really want to come on. <laughs> I felt bad. I was like, I'm annoying the crap out of this guy, but I, I know really it's okay. <laughs> no, I love it. No, uh, I, I especially these days, it's nice when people reach out because my schedule is so hectic that it's, you know, depending on the week, it's hard to schedule guests for the show. I try to, you know, do my best uh, to, you know, to schedule out in advance. But man, the the older Sam gets and the crazier my schedule gets, it's it's hard. So like when you do things like that, it it makes life actually quite easy for me. So <laughs> feel free to hassle me all you want. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, that's right. There are other people. And I get it because yeah. you know, you fall into this um th- this routine of like, you know, it's it's you and you know, Brendan and you know, you have the extra film mm-hmm. uh crew and you guys kind of fall into your own rhythm. I mean, we yeah. we it happened to us and it's like, man, we haven't had anyone on in a while and we we try to keep it constant you know for certain yeah. things and sure it's it's hard to, you know because you just kind of fall into your own thing it's like oh yeah that's right so i am yeah. glad that you reached out um yeah matthew how are you doing today man you're you're back again you are back i know again. and i wasn't expected to come back because i thought that your scud that you people that you were going to have on were full and then one person couldn't make it and i was the replacement yeah man it's it was crazy so uh, r.i.p to leo i hope he's feeling better uh Got into a bit of an accident a few weeks ago, but he's oh, yeah, I've heard about on the that. road to recovery, so that's good. Um, and then Hope you're doing well, bro. Yeah, and then the the uh, the Mister Elusive, Mister J Ledbetter, I'm yeah. watching you. <laughs> 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 if you're listening, <laughs> you will be on this podcast for one of these episodes. <laughs> for Harry Potter, because I know he's a big Potterhead. Um, he is. He he, and, and it's Jay's an enigma to me because they're like. He's like one of uh, like there are things about him that he when once you get to know his taste in movies, you're you're it's easy to to see a certain film or a certain filmmaker like he's a, a huge David Lynch fan for example, nice you know or you know he's a big uh, uh, fan of you know some I'm trying to think of like another series that they've done recently, like they're doing Sergio Leone right now. Mm -hmm. So like there, there are certain ideas when it comes to art and film where I hear and go, yes, Jay would absolutely love that. (laughs) And if you, if for anyone that's ever listened to him and Ryan on extra film, they've also been so absurdly critical of modern like Hollywood filmmaking, blockbuster filmmaking, especially that to hear, like I get surprised from him all the time when he's like, Oh, I'm a big fan of that thing because (laughs) I never see or or hear him praise things like it before. So when he first told me, Oh yeah, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Like what about you makes you think that I (laughs) wouldn't 
<laughs> expect that. There's nothing about Jay that would be like, oh yeah, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Like there's nothing about him. Yeah. So it's, I, I can never, I, I have just stopped guessing. I have just stopped <laughs> guessing when it comes to Jay. <laughs> Yeah, it's. Yeah, I was listening to your guys' Dune review, and he listened. He enjoyed David Lynch's version. I've never seen it because yeah. I've heard and have been told yeah. it was very bad. So I just yeah, I haven't seen it cleared. Either. Yeah, like, I mean now that I, I have a new Dune, I don't need to go back. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and of course Jay is a big fan of Lynch and Lynch's Dune. So you know that didn't surprise me because he's a big Lynch head. Mm. You know. But yeah. uh yeah, I don't yeah, know. He's okay. he's a weird dude, but I love him. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He has he has a nice like bass, like radio sound voice. I'm like Oh, for sure. It's nice and he's stuff. very funny. He's very, he is very funny. funny. Yeah, I, I listen yeah. to extra film, Ryan. I know he thinks that I don't, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's just cer- yeah. certain ones because like the extra film is like, Oh yeah, I know that movie, but I don't know the other movie. Yeah. So I'll it, listen it's, like half the episode. Specifically tailored. And and even before Ryan and Jay, it was always that way because we built that show out of wanting to highlight movies that aren't in the mainstream as much. Right. Um, uh, and, and whether it be classic film or, or indie, like, uh, modern indie film, whatever the case is, that's, that was the whole premise for that whole show. And so they've kind of spun it and made it their own, but that's still kind of the, the general basis of it. Even with some of their movie series right now, they're doing, um Sergio Leone who's a yeah. prominent western filmmaker but some of the directors uh they've chosen to cover don't quite have um they might have a, a prestige reputation but they don't have like a mass wide appeal reputation so um so yeah it's you know I I, I I'm still even with you when it comes to some of that Christian like they'll <laughs> tackle some films I'm like I haven't seen it yeah, uh, I don't know much about it. It's either, like you guys know so. what you're talking about. That's yeah. great. I just but it's fun. Seen yeah, they yeah. they have a great rapport though, so it's it's fun to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. So, gentlemen, before we get into our Order of the Phoenix review, for those who haven't listened to our other episodes, uh, we will go through this more of like a um, <clears throat> just like a speed lightning round thing. We'll start with Matt and then go to JD. Okay. Um, number one, Matt. Again, um, what was your introduction to Harry Potter, and what is your Hogwarts? house okay i'm going to keep this short as possible because i know i've already talked about this before but for those of you who have not listened to any of the previous episodes christian (laughs) (laughs) i got my first introduction with the marketing by by the tv spots and i was like oh this looks interesting and this was back in like second grade i believe and and then my and then my, my grandma took me to go see it in the theater for the first film and i fell instantly fell in love with it i fell in love with the world i love the trio with ron harry and hermione i love the story and i i couldn't wait to see where else where the series was going to go next and i've always wanted to like i said i've always wanted to be a wizard i always wanted to play quidditch i wanted to cast defense spells and, and wrecking some shop and that the and I have read the the few th- first three of the books in like during junior high. I haven't finished the rest of it. I only like finished the first half of the book for the Goblin of Fire and a little bit of the Order of the Phoenix. And I kind of fell off of it afterwards. But I did thought the books were interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's it's always been. It's just great hearing about people's like introduction to Harry Potter and like, you know, how, how invested into the fan base they are. Um, you know, I've, I've read all the books. It's been a while since I've reread all of them all the way through, but definitely need to do that sometimes too. Sometimes it's like, you know, with life, it's like, you know, I, I can capture the magic while, you know, watching the movie, whether it's by book or by film, but, um, I'm, I myself, I'll, um, <laughs> I'm a proud, <laughs> proud Slytherin 100%. Yeah, and I, took the, I, I took the Pottermore quiz like last year before I went to like Universal at the Wizarding World, and I it my results were Hufflepuff, and then I took the BuzzFeed, and it says I was in Gryffindor. But but I'm for me, I'm more like a half Hufflepuff and half Gryffindor. But would I choose Gryffindor? Of course, because I thought I like it more. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Mm-hmm. They, they 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 have they they do have some really nice color uh color patterns there. So yeah. And I, I I did grew up on the video games for the Harry Potter series. I mean, I like played the PlayStation, the first PlayStation Gen for the the first two, and then I played it on the PlayStation Two for the third installment, and then I played the Quidditch World Cup game, which that was mm. so addicting. Like it? that's my favorite <laughs> yes. Harry Potter game of all time, and I'm super excited for the Hogwarts Legacy 
the open world Harry Potter game that we've always wanted for a long, long time. Yeah, I, that that Quidditch game, I used to play it in my local library, like nonstop. And they're like, Christian, you got to like, you know, <laughs> let other We're people like, no, go. <laughs> I'm always stuck eating Ravenclaw. This is, uh... and, and I, I'm not going to lie. I was terrible at that game when I played on the PlayStation 2, but then I played on the PC and I was kicking ass at Quidditch World Cup. I was just so on. I was on a roll. Yeah, it, it was better on PC for sure. That's where I used to play it on. So it was crazy. Some, and some, I, a lot I'm, of not, I'm not even a, a PC guy. I mean, I'm more of a console guy, but I got mm. so addicted to playing on the PC yeah it's it, that game was very dick now i kind of want to look it up and see how much it costs but <laughs> yeah but if you want to get this on playstation 2 you can get it like a 56 bucks on amazon Shh, we're not gonna mm. Mm, yeah, i mean no, no, no. i i probably <laughs> will get it just so because i can play with my two player uh with my brothers because we love harry potter and we want to play that quidditch get that little nostalgic feel yeah i mean i i, I have other methods of getting it you know, like <laughs> but we won't go there. Mr. J.D. Duran, what was your introduction to Harry Potter and what is your Hogwarts house? Uh, so as I stated on episode one of this series, I did not watch these in real time as they came out uh, because that first movie was released uh, when I was in high school. So I was my interests were in different areas at that time. And uh, so I never really watched any of these movies and I had never read the books. I wasn't familiar with any of the lore or characters uh, or any of that. So I did not catch up with these until it, for the first time in a true sense, you know, because I've always, you know, been at parties or been at friend's house and they've like, lingered I got no in the time background. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you're over at a friend's house and it's playing there in the background, you know, things like that. But I've never actually paid attention to them in a true sense until 2014 when my co-host on in session film, Brendan Cassidy said, no, these are actually very good movies. You should, you should watch them. So I took a weekend. <laughs> it didn't start out that way. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to like watch one maybe over the course of a week and then, you know, kind of do it that way. But I watched that first one and was enchanted by it. Uh, that I just binged them all over the course of a weekend and pretty much fell in love uh, with the whole series. So uh, since then, it's been pretty much a yearly tradition. And sometime in the fall, I'll uh, try to watch all of them if I can. So, um, so I haven't, you know, I didn't catch up with them until uh, just a few years ago, I guess. But since then, have become a, a, a passionate fan of the series as for a house, you know, and I, I mentioned this the last time I was here as well. I I've never really taken the quiz. I've never really looked at that <laughs> specifically. Uh, I, I mentioned the last time that I would maybe place myself in Gryffindor because I didn't really know. Uh, I will say though, since looking at it slightly more since the last time I was here, I, I think I'm also, half Gryffindor, half Hufflepuff, for sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe more like 70% Hufflepuff, 30% Gryffindor. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's actually kind of where I lean now looking at it a little bit more since the last time I was here. All right. So we got two Griffin puffs here. Yeah. It seems <laughs> some, some like puffing. Yeah. But yeah. It, it's just such a great refreshing to see a lot of newcomers who are wanting to get invested in the wizarding world and just watching their mm -hmm. reactions and for their first time watching the Harry Potter franchise. It's just so good. I mean, it's even though that they should, yeah. they um, know they should have grown up watching it through the theatrical run, but it's just better late than never. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like me and my sister used to watch it all the time. It was, it's actually funny because she couldn't, pronounce we we're, we're seven years apart she couldn't pronounce hermione's name so she would say her hiney she said her it's hiney. her her hiney so yeah. she couldn't pronounce hermione so she would say her hiney so yeah. for the longest time she's like oh it's her hiney i'm like yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah so you know it's you know we, we grew up watching it together and it like you know for everyone out there who hasn't listened to the others you know i've it's been a part of my life since I was in first grade. My uh, first grade teacher used to read us like a chapter a week uh, of the first book. 
we were just in we didn't really know you know what it was it was just this book called harry potter we didn't know that there were going to be this huge like franchise and we just became just like infatuated in love with it and then boom the movies come out to you know started rolling out in 2001 and i was about ooh, nine years old so mm. around the same age harry was give or take a few years um you know going to hogwarts so i i literally grew up with these these characters they, they've, they've it's just always been a part of my life and um you know regardless of people's you know views of jk rowling she she really did bring something magical to the world yeah. and that, that has yeah. helped out a lot of people you know with, within their own uh trials and tribulations their own hard times mm-hmm. so you mm-hmm. know the thing that she created is it's truly wonderful um, yeah 100 but gentlemen are you ready to get yes. into our review of harry potter and the order of phoenix aka yeah. the underrated masterpiece of mm-hmm. the franchise <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be right back with our Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix review right after this short break. I instructed Harry to form this organization, and I and I alone am responsible for its activity. Dispatch an owl to the Daily Prophet. If we hurry, we should still make the morning edition. Dawlish Shacklebolt, you will escort Dumbledore to Azkaban to await trial for conspiracy and sedition. Ah, I thought we might hit this little snag. You seem to be laboring under the delusion that I'm going to, what was the phrase? Come quietly. Well, I can tell you this. I have no intention of going to Azkaban. Enough of this. Take him! like him, Minister, but you can't deny Dumbledore's got style. All right, and we're back with our Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix review. This movie has, uh, oof, man, it's a crazy, crazy one. So it's directed by Mike Newell. Uh, writers include Michael Goldenberg and, of course, J.K. Rowling as a credited novel and stars the whole, you know, pretty much oh my gosh there's so many people like we got some new faces in here as well of course we have daniel radcliffe rupert grant emma watson um <clears throat> rubius hagrid I, i'm actually dropping um i'm actually blanking on the guy's name <laughs> for the guy who played rubius hagrid but we don't get too much hagrid in this film but of course i mean if you haven't watched harry potter potter in the order of phoenix um it is streaming on hbo max right now uh, mm-hmm. For everyone, the entire series is on there, so go crazy. I could go through the synopsis, but this movie's been out since 2007. And if you were listening to this podcast, you probably already watched the movie. So we're going to go full spoilers in this one like we have for the others. So you have been warned. <laughs> <laughs> you have been warned. So we're going to take this step by step. Wanted to ask you guys. I know Matt's, Matt's already finished watching all of harry potter i mentioned this in every podcast that he's on because he just <laughs> plowed through them i was like whoa man slow yeah, once, down. We, once we got into the series i just watched it just all the way through binged it like crazy and i literally did recently just rewatched it today just for this episode yeah yeah mm. i oh so you rewatched it again yeah oh i okay, did okay yeah I, I rewatched it yeah, that is that. <laughs> uh, JD, did, did you get a chance to rewatch this yourself? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> He's like, of course, it's the best. Any one the opportunity, <laughs> any excuse to watch Order of the Phoenix, and yeah, I'm there. Yeah, I'm just addicted to this movie. I just love watching it again and again, and just love all eight of the films. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is. I believe this is written by David Yates as well. Actually, it's di- it's directed by David Yates, the first time oh director gosh. who actually directed like all the way through the rest of the of the films. Mm. Yeah, and, right. and the one that you mentioned was Mike not Mike Noel. That's the one who directed or um, Goblet, Goblet of Fire. Of Fire. Yeah, yeah, I was switching. I didn't out want to cut you stuff. off. I didn't want to cut you off. I oh, tried, whatever. I was like, not to correct you, Christian. <laughs> it's actually yeah. David Yates. <laughs> I got the show notes mixed up. I was changing everything over. Things are going to get lost in the shuffle. I do apologize. Yes. This is directed by David Yates and he does direct um, here from, from on yeah. out. So yep. 
It's been a whew, man. Oh man, we're we're here. Year five, fifteen year old Harry in the gang, building up <laughs> Dumbledore's army. G- give give me huh? your guys' first thoughts, your, your initial reactions after your rewatch. You know, have you noticed anything different? Was was anything different? Do you love it more than you did before? Is it not quite your favorite anymore? So I guess we'll start with JD, and then we'll go to Matt, and then I'll go to myself. Okay, so I love this movie. This is actually my favorite of the Harry Potter films. And it was the movie that on that first go around in 2015, I found to be the most beguiling in many ways. It's the one that has uh, the most gratifying action sequence, I think. Uh, But maybe more so than anything, the emotion of this film and how it builds stakes, I find... Uh, quite mesmerizing. And this is the first film really in this series, given what we see at the end of the Goblet of Fire. Although there is really the, the ending of that movie is the pivot point to this whole franchise, tonally speaking. But this is the first film to embrace the level of maturity that we would go on to see through the rest of these films Uh, while still maintaining a level of playfulness, but the stakes in this film, we've never really felt them the way we do here yet. Um, And that I think is, is actually quite visceral in the opening sequences of this movie. And I think that's maintained in some really great ways, even when the film does become more playful, I think underneath the veneer of that, is this 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 bubbling um feeling of you know something is about to happen there's this ominous feeling throughout the whole film even when it is being a little bit playful at times and i love that about this movie and i do think the rest of them david yates does a really great job of heightening that tone as the films go on uh but th- there's something about the that maturity in this film coupled with the little action we do get and the, and the character building. This is one of the most emotionally enthralling and thematically rich films in the series. And Christian, you know me, I'm a, I'm a, an emotional guy. I wear it on my sleeves all the time. Listeners of our show know this as well. You know, cause the one thing about order of the Phoenix, maybe more so than any of the rest of the films is, you know, there, there are some great one-liners in this movie. Um, I, you know, you, you think about Sirius Black at the end of the movie when he says, get away from my godson. Uh, or there's the the satisfying fist in the air moment when Harry says, sorry, professor, I cannot tell a lie. Um, or as you, you know, heard there in the clip, you know, say what you will about Dumbledore, you, but you can't deny he's got style. That's, that's a <laughs> wonderful line in this movie. But the one that gets me... And and this is a great tethering of dialogue, the film building stakes and emotion in the way that it does. And then Daniel Ratcliffe's performance, uh, which I think is so good in this movie, especially. You'll never know love or friendship. And I feel sorry for you. That line. Oh, my God. It is incredible. It is so, so good. There's so much pathos to it that I, I is so defining to not only the film, but to Harry. It's a great capper to his arc in this movie. There's, of course, the 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 parallels, but also the, the dichotomy between him and Voldemort throughout the entire film. And for him to have the breaking point that he does there with that line specifically um, and what that means going forward, I just think is impeccable. It is impeccable storytelling and it comes off the heels of this really entrancing fight sequence, um, you know, in the last 30 minutes of this movie, that's just really great. And as much as I love it, it is riveting, but that line from Harry and what it means for him, how it crystallizes his evolution in this movie it's just it's so wonderful i love it so yeah order of the phoenix you mentioned it um a few times already christian 
masterpiece, underrated film in this franchise at the very least. I wholeheartedly agree with with all of that. Like I said, I I I've, I I very adamantly believe this is the best film of the bunch. Yeah, it's it is it, it, like you said. Like there, there are a lot of great one liners. This and I I was um, I didn't watch on HBO Max. I was I have the uh, uh, the 4K disc that I've, that I've been meaning to check out. So I was like course like okay you know you pulled my arm whatever like of course i'm going to watch them but um you know watch like it's you know i've mentioned it in sorcerer's stone and even uh with uh chamber of secrets with uh with brendan that like there's this is like this vintage look especially with the first two they're very like that grainy film like it just it holds up so well and it much like with lord of the rings i mean Gollum, he still holds up to this day it's like it's as if, you know, we're used to seeing, you know, young Daniel Radcliffe. If you look at him now, obviously he is a lot older, but it's like in our minds, like he will forever be, you know, Harry Potter. He will forever be that 15, 16, 17 year old boy who, you know, beat the Dark Lord and, you know, save the Wizarding World, of course. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, with the uh, help of friends, of course. And it just kind of, it's it's so magical. And like you said, it is after like you know uh goblet of fire aka harry potter when shit hits the fan this is really the the first like mature mature film that we get because harry is alone a lot in this movie you know his friends are there but he feels like he has to do all of this alone he feels like he has to you know stop voldemort and you know this yeah. whole rumor of like building dumbledore's army with the rumor of requirements and trying to train up his friends to use patronus charm which it's a great scene and i love that score when it comes in mm-hmm. like oh, it's the music so, is so good uh it's so like i mean even though yeah. this is a darker tale there are those more lighthearted moments with you know dumbledore has got style and whatnot and of course we're fred and george mm-hmm. you know they're what 16 17 of age now so they can <laughs> yeah, yeah they're <laughs> at they're 17 right now and they're out of age where now they can use magic outside of hogwarts yeah so so this will be mm-hmm. their last year of hogwarts i believe yeah Yeah. so Mm -hmm. it's you know the weasleys and what it just it still has that that magic like yeah you kind of see it with the dursleys and then harry being on trial there's just so much here especially Mm -hmm. when you were talking about when you know when harry was saying you know like you'll never know like you know have friends or like no friendship or love like i do and you know i feel sorry for you i really love it even before when Voldemort's like you know like uh Harry Potter you know like you're um you'll lose everything like it's just like yeah. that's his it builds to that line yeah it incredibly does well for yeah. sure and even that duality you mentioned earlier of him feeling alone and angry all the time and him wrestling with that juxtaposed with him taking on this leadership role and you know trying to essentially get all of his friends up to speed on what he knows and, and seeing him own that leadership role is certainly very charming throughout the film. And, and so seeing the progression in Harry throughout through that duality, I think is really great, but it gives that, that specifically gives weight to that line later on. So it's the line in and of itself is great and Daniel Ratcliffe says it with such conviction, but it's the way the film builds stakes through its tone and that maturity that when it's delivered there, it just hits like a ton of bricks. And it is absolutely phenomenal. And and it becomes really the thesis for Harry and his friends throughout the rest of the film that you know, they, they do have something to fight for. And there are obviously complications and complexities to it throughout the rest of the film, but that is really the central thesis the rest of the way. Yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, Harry just, you feel, like I said, you know, he feels like he's alone. And then you have Dumbledore and him wondering, like, yeah. Harry's so afraid that he's like, oh, he's like, we're so much alike. And Dumbledore's like, it's not, it's about how you're different. Cause like, yeah, mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of similarities between them and mm-hmm. obviously we mm-hmm. know why, but it's, it's, it's such a beautiful well, message. And Dumbledore abandoning him throughout the film is another yeah. reason he feels so isolated and alone yeah, and because Dumbledore really believed that he, if, if he distanced himself from him, then he wouldn't be much in, in danger that he was before and that he thought it was the right thing to do. 
Yeah. Yeah. Matt, go ahead and give your, your thoughts as well. Sorry. <laughs> That, no, it's no worries, no worries. I mean, you you guys pretty much took you guys pretty much took the words up right out of my mouth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is definitely an underrated film, and that, that not a lot of people like, which surprises me. I just love the way it was paced. I love the action. I love the epic showdown, and I love when we're getting to Harry's psychosis of him dealing with the grief of loss of Cedric and being fully alone from everyone close to him. And one of my favorite scenes is with when he's um meeting with luna for the first time and knowing that he that her and him they both suffered a tragic loss and in giving and telling her and she telling harry that the only way that the dark lord can be able to defeat you is that if you're alone and you wouldn't be much of a threat and he realizes that no i ha- i can't be distanced from my friends i gotta go and reunite with them again and step up he didn't just sit there and whine about it and just like oh i hate everything everyone hates me blah 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 no he was able to maintain the maturity of for him and in him being a step up being a leader and being a teacher it was such a refreshed take that we haven't seen before mm-hmm. we finally get him get a chance to see him perform more defense spells that we haven't seen in the previous films and the opening of the film i love the opening because when harry was going to the play- playground and he's sitting on the swing and he's looking at the mother and his and her two kids it just reminds him that he doesn't have real love parents in his life it reminds him of him what he have lost and and the moment that the dementors started coming into the muggle world he's no longer safe he's on his own without any help yeah, it's it, it kind of mm-hmm. like screeches from our Goblet of Fire review where we were talking about how, you know, that that really was the movie where, you know, Harry has to start proving himself, you know, that he can actually take on these challenges because within episodes, well, not episodes, but books one and book two with Order of Phoenix, I mean, not Order of Phoenix, excuse me, Chamber of Secrets and Philosopher's Stone. You know, he even says in this film, he's like, you know, when, when he's trying to get people to sign up for Dumbledore's army that, you know, he's like, yeah, he's like, it all sounds great when, you know, oh, Harry Potter, you know, mm-hmm. the boy who like defeated the basilisk and, you know, fought off a hundred mentors at once. And he's like, yeah, he's like, it all sounds great on paper when you say it like that it sounds amazing. But right. he's like a lot of that stuff. He's like, I had help. He's like, I didn't do it all by yeah. myself he couldn't have yeah he no said one. like hey it was all out of luck like you all like you said it's all sound great on paper but when you hear his side of the story he's telling them making it very clear like yeah it sounds great but i didn't know what i was doing at the time i always had help i n- didn't always do all these crazy stuff on my own and and, and he's telling these kids that yeah, you can learn all these great spells in real life, but it's not going to be like school where you can try again tomorrow. But when you're in a life and death situation and you're one step closer away from dying or losing the person you love, you don't know what that's like. And as we get into that epic showdown with the Death Eaters and then Sirius and the, um, the Order comes in and saves the day, you and you see Harry and uh, Sirius teaming up and then Be- Bellatrix kills him. And this is the first time he actually suffered a true loss. It may be Cedric, but it was definitely Sirius Black, the one, his godfather, the one he, the closest him to have a family. And seeing his performance and breakdown, him screaming out loud and just out of devastation, it was such a powerful moment in the scene of the film. And they muted uh, Daniel Radcliffe's voice from screaming out loud because he definitely did scream, which is, I'm curious to hear it. I want to hear him scream, but I get muting it will make it even more dramatic. I, I I think that's an incredible sound sound design choice from a filmmaking perspective and from a storytelling perspective. Yeah, is sir, and and what you're talking about is is really important to the choices that he does make at the end. With that line I mentioned earlier, the fact that he's already struggling with the death of Cedric, which is as we noted the pivot point that launches him into suffering from these visceral nightmares, which then leads to that isolation that he's feeling. And there's, so there's no denying that the death of Cedric had a massive effect on him. Uh, But then seeing his godfather also die in front of him after things seemingly were starting to, you know, at least the battle seemed to be turning more toward their way it does remind us that the stakes are still very high and that death goes both ways. 
And, and I think that's what just makes that such a, a gut punch of a moment, especially given the, the moments uh, they shared previously in the movie. I, mean, I think what I love so much about Harry Potter comparatively to a lot of other IP films in the last 30 years is that these movies are not afraid to slow down. You know, there, there is some action in this movie. There's the, the training montages, but Harry Potter, all of the films, but especially this one, they're, they will take their time. You know, they will let the actors and the dialogue carry the weight of, you know, whatever is going on dramatically uh, right. and especially emotionally. And those that those moments between Sirius Black and Harry early on in the film, as they're talking about family, is so potent. It is really, really great. Of course, the performances heighten a lot of that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, what was it? The first time they see each other, there's that really charming embrace between the two. You know, there's the, the conversation they have when they're at Sirius Black's home. And he's talking about how there's good and bad in, in everybody. It's it's oh, yeah. what you choose that defines you, which is great foreshadowing for that moment that I keep talking about at the end of this movie, because it it it, it very well could have come down to Harry killing Beatrix with oh, yeah. whatever spell. He could have chosen that. And 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 you see it in his face that he wants to, but he doesn't. Instead he chooses empathy, really. He yeah. feels he feels sorry for Voldemort. And I mean, the that is an incredible turn. Yeah, because because ever since that Sirius told him, like, yeah, we all have a dark side, mm-hmm. uh, demons, demons in us, because the world is not black and white. It's we live in a fully mm-hmm. gray world. Yeah. And yes, we always do have a light, but there's always a darkness in us. But it's how we choose to define it, and that really got mm-hmm. me a lot, especially yeah. at the end Same. of the film, where now he's trying to confront his dark side, and from Voldemort taking control over him, and you see that, uh, yeah, like you said, um. You will never find love or friendship, and I feel sorry for you. That really and got me mm-hmm. so good. I was like, "Wow, incredible!" It, yeah, because yeah, even at the end, it does end on a hopeful note. Even when they're going through in a bad patch, th- there is still hope. There is still worth fighting for. The difference between him and Voldemort is that Voldemort does not have friends. They follow him out of fear, and mm-hmm. and and that's yep. and Harry. He has people in his life that he they care about. Uh, they choose yep. him out of love. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think that with I mean with with Harry, he is very um I mean, I guess you could say self sufficient in a way, but you know, everything you guys have been saying, you guys have been hitting it right on the mark and it's it you know, everything that's been happening this school year with you know, with uh Cornelius Fudge, like not believing that, you know, Voldemort's back and he, like you guys said, you know, he had yeah. a chance to kill Bellatrix and even you even see like Voldemort's like oh like you know the spell and it's like oh did you see the little bit of a a little did you see notice the little bit of a throwback of like doing that little return of the Jedi where he tries to give into the darkness give in to your hatred give in to your (laughs) anger do it it was very much that (laughs) Uh, we watched it again I was like oh yeah this is a little bit similar to what happened in return of the Jedi like give in to your hate anger yeah (laughs) it it, is yeah because it's you know, Harry, he's he's pissed off like the entire movie, pretty much. And then everything. Oh, yeah, he's, he's totally very fr- angry. Yeah, he's <laughs> very frustrated and angry all the time. But at least he doesn't sit there and just pout and whine about it. He still was able to mature a little bit more and step up to, to the game. And in and, and, and this and we got the um, Unbridge, who has now been hi- hired to become the defense against the dark arts teacher and taking control over Hogwarts and putting up these absurd rules to make sure that none of these kids perform any defense spells to prepare for a war. And, and she is like literally the worst person on the face of the earth that you would want her dead like she's like worse than Voldemort Beatrix and the Dursleys and yeah. Malfoy They're, she's the worst of them all she's a class A sociopath like you can I'm literally mm-hmm. fantasizing of how many ways we can just murder her yeah we really don't yeah. see a lot of Malfoy this uh this time around um oh yeah it, that's true it, I mean yeah there, sure he's but, still a little bit of a, a dick but well, he's I mean, not but he's not in it as much 
Yeah, we see yeah. a Malfoy, yeah. but it's not Draco. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Malfoy is my but mom. But how, how epic it was to see Dumbledore coming in and save the day and fu- going to epic showdown between him and Voldemort. It just shows you at his full capacity, and it was yeah. a visually stunning and epic to watch. Yeah, yeah I mean, the coloration. Yeah, oh my ahead. gosh. Oh yeah, I, yeah, it's the coloration incredible. is so beautiful. I mean, oh man. It was great because like, you know, we, we finally get to see what skills wizards are capable of. You know, we we've always been hearing about yeah. it, you know, from year 1 through 4. Like we kind we kind of see it in year 4 with Goblet of Fire, but you know, this is like, you know, the Death Eaters and, you know, the Order of the Phoenix at, at work, you know, what's with, with the black and um, super light shadows and just like the conflict fighting with each other. And then finally going to the ministry to search for the other uh, prophecy. And it really shows yeah, you like, the, Hey, the you scene know, in like, the hallway when yeah, but the scene in the hallway when they're trying to find the, the, that, um, that globe thing for the prophecy, it was so subtle and dark when there, when there's no music yeah. and you just see yeah. one of the death eaters come. And then you see Lucius Malfoy revealing himself and try to take it from the, the prophecy away from him. Yeah. And it was just, just chills like they're there it's shits hits the fan right at that moment yeah and like yeah. they were like oh, it's mr malfoy I'm like you guys know this man was a death eater <laughs> well, actually way- harry knew about it well harry knew because oh, yeah, he saw yeah, his harry reveal knew. when he was uh in the um tom riddle's uh cemetery yeah. while yeah, he's just being holed down and then you see the um, return of voldemort and you see the death eaters coming in and revealing themselves especially lucius which yeah. is thematically appropriate because as you guys mentioned earlier, a lot of what we see at Hogwarts with Harry and his friends is him teaching them the difference between what we learn at school and reality. Yeah. And the idea that, you know, it's not always what you think it's going to be based off of what it is in the classroom. And for most of them, this is the first time they're in a a real world scenario like that. So for them to react with some trepidation there, I think is very appropriate to the storytelling of the, of the film. Yeah. Because the acting is so authentic and we get a little bit more Neville this time around where now he's, you're seeing a little bit more in depth with his character, especially with um, Bellatrix, the one, the responsible for performing the Cruciatus curse on Neville's parents. And you definitely know that him and uh, Harry have a lot more in common than what we think. We thought yeah. they would. Again, going back to the scenes between Sirius and Harry, that moment when he gives them the original fo- photo of the Order of the Phoenix, they talk about Neville's parents. And it's a very tender moment when Sirius reveals what happens to them. And then later on, there's a great scene between Neville and Harry when they're looking into a mirror talking ab- about you know, any potential revenge that could come their way. And again, it's very tender and certainly highlights the, the gravitas of this film tonally and its maturity. Yeah. Yeah. It's Neville scary, yeah. really continues to grow with his bravery. Like he's not just mm-hmm. some wimpy kid that we see a few years ago. He's really evolved as a character now because he has a lot of potential than what he is led to believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, when you have, you know, going like to the photo where right before Harry goes back to school, and um, um, Sirius is showing him the photo, and it's very like even even the like what he was saying, you know, like he's like, oh, he's like Neville's parents, and he's like, you know, they suffered a fate um, worse than death, if you ask me. Yeah, and it's very. Line. And then yeah. you know, going with um, Neville, like with seeing his um, parents' picture in the mirror, when he's saying, you know, like I'm quite, he's like, I'm quite proud to be their son. Oh and yeah, it's so uh, heartbreaking. I, I, it's very like it's you know th- there's always going to be the funny moments and like you know the the british humor and whatnot and you know i love yeah. that stuff but it it really comes down to just like i mean like overall like harry potter is such like a not a downer so but it's it's pretty negative at times like it's just a very dark tale but there's like these yeah. spurts of bright light that gives you hope and even though, you know, things do look grim, like you guys were saying, you know, this is the first time that not Harry, but Harry's classmates are starting to understand like, hey, this is what Harry's been going through since he started school. 
Like there's yeah. always been something yeah. there and they're starting to understand like, yeah, like this is real. Like they do believe that Dumb- uh, not Dumbledore is back, but Voldemort is back. But yeah, there are, you know, some of the naysayers within the school who, you know, Harry Potter or whatever, and they don't quite believe Harry. And then it's, you know, even the whole, um, the whole, um, uh, the court scene, you know, like they're, they're trying so much to like, it's all so excessive for a 15 year old kid who used a Patronus charm during a yeah. Dementor attack. And they're like, Oh, like it may not have been the ministry who sent them to set up Harry, but we know someone else who's out there. And then the minister is like, no. Yeah. Fudge is living in denial that the dark yeah. Lord is back. And I do believe once, because the moment that Harry just saw Lucius talking to fudge before the court, I do believe that, that Lucius was one behind all this and manipulating the ministry into believing that the dark Lord is back and trying yeah. to take control of oh, oh, the ministry of magic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it says a lot about, why that denial is important to the ministry because they don't want to create a sense of panic. They don't want to, maybe they don't even want to believe that it's real. And so they go out of their way to undermine Harry, even at something so simple and something that is ultimately silly, which is what I love about Dumbledore's response at the trial where he's like, this is, this is absurd. What are we doing here? And ultimately, like, that's his argument. He's not even, you know, they do bring in a witness and she gives her little testimony. But ultimately, his argument is, this is dumb. What are we doing? Yeah, this is completely a waste of time. We need to act now. And you're not listening to us. Yeah, but it does say something that that's the reaction. And I think that is further heightened, which is what I love about the Dolores character here. And for one... Imelda Staunton and her performance is incredible. It is so much fun. It is incredible. I mean, as you guys were talking about earlier, the fact that we loathe her so much, it, part of that is on the page, but it's mostly in Imelda Staunton's performance and how uh, just uh, how she chews up that character so wonderfully. But the, that character, I think, is heightened to a degree very intentionally because of the 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 power in that denial from the ministry and the and how they want to control the situation at all costs i mean that first moment when she gets up there at hogwarts and she starts saying like you know something to the effect of you know like some of the things you've been taught here we don't need to be doing that anymore and it's so like abrasive and in your face but she goes up there and says it so matter of factly you know so antagonistically like she doesn't even care and like but it's calmly told to uh the children and it's in front of all the other professors and in front of Dumbledore you know and and so the fact that she's so brazen in that regard uh I think says a lot about how desperate the ministry is to control the situation uh which again I think helps elevate the overall tone of the film and how this movie builds stakes um, so I, I, all of that is really great. And of course, like the way that character crystallizes is, in, you know, it's very satisfying. Yeah. With, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with Umbridge, it's, you know, w- when she's talking, you know, to all the students after, you know, the big feast, after the sorting hat thing that, you know, that they do every single year, um, kind of, uh-huh. kind, of kind of sad. We don't really get to see any more of those. I'm not going to lie. Be kind of cool. But um, the way that she like presents herself, like she, it's, it's how she controls a room. Like she's very like polite, yeah. but stern at the same time. And very just uh, exactly yeah. very strict, but like, yeah, she's a stick in the mud, but it's, there's something about her, like her aura, her persona that obviously she is with the ministry. Yeah. So that already grants her, you know, the power of the room and them interfering at hogwarts to make sure you know to show to the public you know like we're here you know we have someone from the ministry at hogwarts like everything is fine like everything is fine and it's like they're Mm. they're literally panicking to cover up every single track and it's you know ron doesn't even really understand what's going on 
And then <laughs> Hermione's like, well, yeah, it's, you know, it, because the way she said it, it was in a very beating around the bush way of saying, hey, mm-hmm. you know, like we're here to make sure that, you know, things are going well the way that we need them to be going yeah. well for the sake of the public. And, you know, the, the defense against the dark arts classes, it's, it's like, well, you know, she's saying, why would you ever need to learn any of these spells? You know, you're in school, you're here to learn. And, you know, Harry pushes back in that, um, in that scene where he just kind of just snaps. He's like, I don't know, like it's, you know, it's Lord Voldemort. And she just, she mm-hmm. has that quick, like enough kind of thing. And it just, and she goes automatically back. It's like, she's holding herself back. Yeah. And you see, you hate you see Harry snapping at the uh, umbridge because right now she's telling lies about what happened to Cedric Diggory and he sh- they're dishonoring his memory and you're like what yeah. the hell are you doing that's not what happened I was there when he got killed and yeah. you're trying to dishonor his memory yeah and Harry's yeah. like oh then he just like dropped dead of, by his own accord just you know like why would Harry be making this up and it, he really yeah. has to kind of like well Harry doesn't even try to like prove to everyone that like oh like i have proof it's like well i was there i was there the night cedric died yeah. and a lot of you know even with uh seamus um, oh yeah he snapped at him too it's like i can't believe that you're everyone's calling me a liar and you just will just snapped right at him t- took a little stab at his mom too i was like ooh, yeah. Yeah. I was like, damn dude like that's, he ain't holding back <laughs> and that's what i love so much about harry in this film you certainly understand the emotional context of of you know him witnessing Cedric die and no one else was around to see it so he's he's the only one that's been able to that's had to wrestle with it in in the visceral ways that he does and then others are not even believing him and he does snap at him he snaps at Ron even at one point and it's not even just that you know we what we do understand you know, emotionally why he's doing that. But at the same time, the, the way he lashes out is still rough around the edges. Like it's, it still makes him uh, a little bit of a complicated character in this movie, really for the first time in this series, which I find interesting, you know, because, you know, I, like, I, I, I love that the film isn't, they don't want us to just see him through a specific lens or a specific prism throughout the entirety of, of this whole runtime. I mean, he's going to make mistakes and he's going to show human emotion and he's already, you know, he's starting to feel isolated for all the reasons we talked about earlier. And then all of that just starts to compound on itself. And he, and there's a couple of times it gets cathartic and, while we understand it at the same time, there's not really a justification for it when these are his classmates or these are his friends. Like Ron has been by his side. Ron literally just mm. stood up for him. Yeah. They go back to the room and he yells at Ron un- unjustifiably. So, you know, or snapping at the dude's mom. Like, uh, I don't know if you had to go that far with it. <laughs> And so I, I, he was, I love I that. Think he I was love well it. within his right because he was getting well, tired. <laughs> okay. Because he was getting fed up by getting crapped on by a lot of people and just calling yeah. him a liar. And he's just yeah. so sure. frustrated and fed up with it. But calling for, for, someone for sure. out There's, for their mother is yes. characteristic of Harry. It, exactly. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I understand him lashing out. I understand mm-hmm. the emotional context. Does he take it maybe a little step too far? I think there's an argument to be made is mm-hmm. all that I'm saying. But I love that in the writing. And I mm-hmm. think Daniel Radcliffe taps into that impeccably in his performance. Yeah, as we and there's a scene where Snape is trying to teach him how to control his mind from being mm-hmm. taken from the Dark Lord, and he's just pushing him and pushing him and try to get him to listen, but he's tired and frustrated. He's not focused, and he's Snape is giving him the ultimatum, like, "Hey, life is not fair, so you can't just sit there and whine about it all the time in life. Life isn't fair." And and then he crossed the line by talking about his father, that he was a, that he was horrible. But then Harry just tapped it into his memory and he saw what his dad did to him. And he saw the worst mm-hmm. side of his father that he had not seen before. He was his Malfoy. Mm-hmm. Literally, he got yeah. bullied in school and it, it overwhelmed him because he because through the years, the people, that you know, and especially serious, he only heard the best things about his father and not the worst things about him. And it was that just took a different dramatic mm-hmm. turn. I do think 
what saves that scene for me is the is is how that uh how that scene comes about because i do think narratively speaking that is a jarring left turn that arguably doesn't belong here now it does plant seeds for the dynamic between those two that play out in later films so i understand why it's here in that regard but given the stakes of this film it's central story the beating heart of it emotionally and even thematically that is a jarring left turn that could have been edited out but i do think it makes sense in the context of harry is struggling psychologically and emotionally because of this tethering between him and voldemort we need to get to the heart of the matter and so snape is testing him because he knows that Voldemort is not going to take it easy on him. So he's pushing boundaries. And for the reasons you're talking about when, because he's tired and, you know, you know, whatever the case may be, he kind of snaps back at Snape resulting in this epiphany through this vision that he has between Snape and his father that, you know, and while that plant seeds for later on the fact that you have those two going toe to toe. I do think that in and of itself makes sense in the context of this movie. And it does plant seeds that are necessary for later films. So the, the, the movie kind of brilliantly gets to have its cake and eat it too. I think. Yeah. I, I, for me, I love that scene. I mean, it just shows you the reason why Snape couldn't stand Harry throughout the years and why he's, why he's being so mean to him all these years, because he just reminds him of his, of the father, of his father being a bully. I mean, it was crazy just to see it. And just in his performance was in Daniel Radcliffe's performance was so believable because he's so overwhelmed and shocked because he only saw the, the best side of him and not at his worst. Yeah. I mean mm. that, and I mean, Snape used to be a death eater, so he knows how the dark Lord you know, is working and he's saying, you know, Voldemort isn't resting at all. And you, you see, mm-hmm. you know, obviously Snape is part of the order. And like you guys said, and it's want to point out that not all Gryffindors are all sunshines and rainbows. <laughs> uh, no, you're, you're absolutely, you know. I do agree that, that not, that it's not like black mm-hmm. and white or anything because any house can be a bully, no matter what house you're mm-hmm. in, whether it's Slytherin or Gryffindor, whatever, anyone can be a bully. Yeah, it's so almost it, as if we shouldn't put people in boxes. Imagine <laughs> that. <laughs> it's like there's only four houses, really? All right, <laughs> <laughs> you can only be one of these four characteristics, and that's it. Nothing else. That's this it. all defines you. Yeah. Can we get the rest of the house have a bigger, more things to do because they've been like sidelined. But the only bigger like character, the one character that had a bigger arc was Luna, the Raven, the House of Ravenclaw. Oh yeah, I mean even in the mm-hmm. book, she is by far my favorite um, character of Order of the Phoenix. Like she, she plays her. I, I and I don't know the actress's name. I do apologize, but I think she plays her like beautifully. Like even when we're first introduced to her, you know, it's it's a little joke. It's like with um hermione she's like oh everyone this is lenny this is luna love good <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. just awkward yeah. i mean it's it's that kid mentality where it's like oh yeah like this is what people call some this other this girl behind her back so that's Ooh. what she's associating yeah. with and she's like oh crap <laughs> like i just said it out loud and she had to you know, yeah, I love stuff. Luna. I mean, she's adorable, but she's weird. But she's the kind of person that you would want to have around as a friend. I mean, she's amazing. Mm-hmm. Very, very wise Ravenclaw. I mean, she definitely fits oh, yeah. that character. <laughs> Ivana Lynch is the actress's Ivana name. Ivana Lynch. Did you know that one of the cast members of the Harry Potter, like Neville or Jenny, or in uh, the actress who played Luna, when they took the test, they had a different house. In in her in well, Luna's character, um, the actress who played Luna, she got a Gryffindor. I'm not even kidding. Really? She didn't get Rivenclaw. And oh. then you got the actor who played Neville. He got Hufflepuff. That's funny. And um, I'm sorry, I, keep, I keep laughing at Shady's joker. He's like, oh, it's almost like we should have put people in boxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's that's, so, because it's that's so always true. worked out great historically. Right. It's like, <laughs> nope. You know, like Game yeah. of Thrones. Nope. But I, I really, and I kind of actually wanted to throw in, like, with Game of Thrones, that whole story is about conflicts of the human heart and you kind of see that i mean you see that a lot through this film you know i mean the world of game of thrones is very gray there is no 
super noble person, not even, you know, Lord Snow himself, of course. But within this movie, you really see the light and dark in a lot of people. Um, it's, but, you know, Harry's mm-hmm. just, he, he's troubled. He, and he wants to know why are me and Voldemort like so alike? And then with Siri saying, oh, we believe that Voldemort's after something he didn't get last time. And I'm like, okay, Harry, if you did not pick up on that, <laughs> but you kind of, you know, you figure out throughout the prophecy that, you know, neither can live, you know, essentially in harmony, in harmony. Neither, can, a- neither, neither can live nor survive. One of them is going to have to kill the other in the end, which that was so intense to just to him explaining it to Dumbledore about the prophecy, even, even though that Dumbledore knew it all along. Yeah. And it's like, Harry's starting to realize, I mean, he knew the severity of it, but it's like, I mean, we, he's, when you see Voldemort facing off against um, Professor Dumbledore, it's like, it's like two masters at work and it's just this huge, you know, it's just yelling and kind of like a few pants here and there, but it really demonstrates like, this is how powerful Voldemort is. You keep hearing about it, all these things that he does, you know, when he um, essentially, I guess you could say possesses slash mind controls Harry in a way. And it's like, I don't, there's something about Voldemort's presence where like, honestly, I would put him on par with Darth Vader when it comes to that spooky presence. Cause like anyone that this man comes across, it's like, you know, they, they have, like um, you guys said earlier, like everyone obeys Voldemort out of fear. And it's, it, it's, it really is like the, the, the Darth Vader of Harry Potter. It's like, Oh crap. Like it's Voldemort. Like he was spared no expense. Like he, you know, the, the, the heir of Slytherin. Um, and it's, I, I I do love Voldemort as a character though because he's just speaking of, speaking of Voldemort. The difference between him and the Emperor Palpatine is that Palpatine succeeded by taking over the galaxy, and and Voldemort could not succeed taking over Hogwarts. He failed. Well, yeah, um, Palpatine is <laughs> more like to crack that crafty. joke. <laughs> he's I mean, he's he was literally playing both sides to his advantage. Yeah, I, I, no, don't get me wrong. I love Voldemort, and I <laughs> yeah. love the actor of Ray Fiennes. He's a f- terrific part. Um, perfect choice to play the role i was gonna say i think part of what i love about the world building and the and the storytelling of these movies is that if you're like me and you come into this without knowing any of the history or the lore and honestly i've never really looked into it and i haven't read all of the books i've only read the first the first book so far so when it comes to the history of Voldemort, unless you do the research, you don't, especially at this point in the series, you don't really know much about his history. And the films build up this, this allure, not really allure, but this kind of mystery, this, the, the, this feeling that, you know, he's, you know, like this ominous feeling that he's very dangerous. So, from what we know at this point in the series, he very much could have been a Palpatine or he very much could have, you know, been a Hitler and had, you know, had done all of these crazy things uh, that, you know, render a lot of that fear that these characters demonstrate that Harry demonstrates that the film, which is, uh, you know, one of the, the subtle little touches of this film that I love in that regard is is when Dumbledore and Voldemort are having their little battle there at the end and Harry inches closer to Dumbledore and he just throws his hand back and just takes Harry right off of his feet. Like, I do not want you anywhere near this. It's a subtle little moment. You can almost (laughs) miss it if you don't, if you're not paying attention. Yeah, you just push it like, better luck next time, kid. Pushes him. Like, (laughs) but, you know, that to me, I think also says a lot about the the potency of the situation what's at stake and just how dangerous this guy is Mm -hmm. so i i I do love how the film kind of builds up that the mystery and the suspense around voldemort and what he's capable of yeah him pushing pushing harry back from danger because he knows how dangerous he is dangerous of voldemort is because he's not ready to face him yet because he's at, at, at his full capacity at that point it says a lot about both of their characters because you know, when Harry finally sees the the raw power um, and strength of Voldemort, it all he's a fifteen year old kid, and I feel like 
people don't really understand. Like, yeah, like he may may look a little bit older, but I think he was about 15, 16 years old while shooting these. Cause I mean, they kind of, well, give or take, he might've been like 17, 18. Yeah. Because this is not one of the, it could have, the, the franchise could have been shot like one year to the next at the same, at the same time, but it, they well, started to get a little bit couldn't. older. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they couldn't because, and they had different directors coming in and shoot the movie and get a fresh take. Yeah. And, they did it for like the first And they always you know. do. They always skipped every other year. Like we have to wait a couple of years or a few, or one year. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, Harry Potter, Goblet of Fire came out in what, 2004? Yeah, it came out in 2005, a 2005, year after sorry, Prisoner yeah. of Azkaban. But then a couple of years later, we got Order of the Phoenix. Yeah, Order so of Phoenix it was like two came years later 20, that we had to wait. Uh, I mean, 2007. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was so, seven. Yeah, so it's it's very, uh, you know, it, people need to realize, like, yeah, I, like, I, they all look still look like, you know, they could be 14, 15 years old, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just very, um, oh, that's right. Yeah, Prisoner of Azkaban came out in 2004. And then Calvin Fire came out in 2005. That was my bad. Um, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the older actors, they, they always play younger characters all the time. And they could still look like they're like 15 or 16. I mean, mm-hmm. I had a lot of people telling me that I don't look like I'm 29. And I look like I'm like f- like 15 or 16. I was like, oh, wow. And I, when I told them I'm 29, they did not believe me. <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> Yeah, and a little makeup goes a long way too. Yeah, True. that too. It's more of you know people need. They, it's about genetics. Well, yeah, I was gonna say I'm just, that. I'm kidding, but no, you're fine. <laughs> um, so like when you know when Harry is inching towards Dumbledore, like I mean he's a 15 year old kid who's scared. He's going through all the stuff at 15 years old, and then mm. it really says a lot about Harry because you know he's never seen this from Voldemort, so it's like. I need to get as close to the person I trust the most, like as quickly as possible. And then mm-hmm. Voldemort, obviously, obviously, uh, obviously if you, as you guys were saying, you know, he kind of like pushes them back and it's like, no, like you are better off to the side away from all of this. And mm-hmm. it, it really just shows, you know, like these kids are going through a lot and mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it's, I guess you can call it like all like teenage angst or teenage drama, but, um, but I think because Harry is actually not acting like an ordinary kid, but this is a kid who has grown up way too quickly. Like he has to mature more because he's already, he's the most in danger out of all the people in his life and he has to grow up way too quick. Yeah. It, it really Which is just... what I love about the, the professors at Hogwarts and how, they react to Harry, even going back to the first movie and all of these movies, they react to him knowing that's going to be the truth because they know, I mean, you mentioned earlier that, um, that Dumbledore knows what's eventually going to happen, that he's going, that Harry's going to have to fight Voldemort. And if he, if he's going to survive, he's going to have to kill him. Like Dumbledore knows that. In fact, most likely all of these professors know that to one degree or another and and they treat harry at every turn knowing that truth and knowing that he's having to grow up in a way that's just going to be very different than everybody else yeah and it's so tender like i mm-hmm. i love how tender that is yeah it's yeah and there's a scene where where um sirius is telling that voldemort is building up an army and in and- and when you see Mrs. Weasley telling Sirius, like, no, he's just a boy. And Harry's like, mm-hmm. no, I, if he's building up an army, I want to fight. And he's the yeah. first person to say that. And even though he's mm-hmm. a 15 year old kid who's too young to, to do all this, he's acting like more an adult out of all the kids. Yeah. I mean, he really, yeah, he, he does. He really does not have a choice. Cause I mean, as you know, we see in, no. you know, farther on that, you know, with Snape says, oh, like you've been raised, like even Snape doesn't really like he knows, but he does like, you know, he's been raising him essentially as like as a pig for slaughter yeah. because Dumbledore knows what has to happen. And it's like, yeah. well, let, yeah. let's, you know, let it's, it's kind of like, you know, not, not I don't want to make that comparison. I'm sorry. I won't say it, but yeah. I mean, but, I would love to talk about the final installment, but that should be on a different episode. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would, I would yeah. go, I would go in and talk about this. We're, we're close. We're so close. I mean, I would love to talk about that scene about the reveal so bad. <laughs> But to to that scene that you were talking about earlier when Mrs. Weasley essentially saves him from hearing all of this truth, I, I think what's so fascinating about that moment, it does say a lot about Harry and how he feels regarding uh, 
how, how ready he feels he is to fight. But the adults in the room, they are so torn. Like they want to tell him the truth because they know he needs to hear the truth, but also he's 15. Is he mature enough to handle this? And, and they struggle with it. You see it in their faces. Like, yeah, I mean, do we tell them? Do we not tell them? You know, that's the, that's all, that's what Sirius Black is struggling with as he starts to tell him what's going on, but he can't get it out because he's trying to word it in a way that a 15 year old could handle. But before he gets there, Mrs. Weez is like, nope, we're done. We're done here. Yep. We're, we're not, we're not going to do that right now. I mean, it would have been great to see the adults perspective and what they were talking about. I mean, even though we know now, since we got through all the films, but it would have been great to see the, uh, hear the whole conversation that we didn't get a chance mm-hmm. to hear. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, now obviously the books, this book is super thick. It's like stupid boy thick. I mean, th- there's obviously a lot more that goes on, you know, that from, from what they were able to adapt, I think they did a really good job. I know order of the mm-hmm. Phoenix isn't necessarily like everyone's favorite, but it should be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to change I, everyone's I, letterbox, <laughs> Harry Potter, like hacking yeah. and being like, it's number one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never understand the resistance to this movie. I never did. I I'm think like, this it, is beautiful. I, it is so nuanced, so textured. I love the, the maturity of it the emotion of it you know there's there there's a palpable emotion that just bubbles throughout the the entirety of of the runtime yeah and all all the characters in the movie like fred and george hermione and ron they were a lot better written than they were in the last movie because Mm -hmm. even because you know you see fred and george being all immature and in kind of goofballs but now they they've come around and they really grew and involved around through the film and that's what i love about it especially ron he was way more supportive with harry than he was in the last film speaking Mm -hmm. of twins you guys have both seen last night in soho right Yes. Mm-hmm. So there is a set of twins and the last night in Soho and they are played by Fred and George Weasley. Really? Mm. I didn't know that. The, uh, the scene where, um, <clears throat> uh, and then we're talking about another movie. Really Spoiler crazy. alert. Yeah. Right. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <alert>. <laughs> if you haven't yeah. seen it. Yeah. But, um, it, so when, um, when Thomason's character and, um, on Enchanted Taylor George's character, like when they're first doing like the mirror acting, because there's like a lot of practical effects in that movie. Yeah. Um, the two butlers, and that you can kind of see them like there's like one on each side. Uh, that's Fred and yeah. George Weasley. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That's that's Fun smart. Facts. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It's amazing. So yeah, I found that out. I was like, oh yes, a Harry Potter reference. <laughs> <laughs> they're yeah. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, we've been talking here for a while and, you know, I always enjoy having you guys on. I want to take up too much of your guys' um, you know, Wednesday hump day night. You know, we got we got two more days left of the week before we can get to no, the week. No worries. I mean, for me, I when, we, when it comes to Harry Potter and any other like blockbuster franchise, I geek out and never talk. Stop talking about it. I mean, I can talk about this all night, son. Yeah. You should listen mm-hmm. to Inception Film Podcast. So they definitely yeah. uh, they, they have yeah. a very long run. To, I can the runtime is unmatched. I cannot. I've, I've tried and I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's I, 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 mean, I don't know how you guys do, but I, I absolutely love it because it gives me something to listen thank you. to. I mean, it depends on on the movie with something like Eternals or Dune, like, you know, we it's easy to spend an hour on those movies because there's so much to talk about. It really is. You know, where, you know, something like Spencer or Last Night in Soho, you know, it's easy to make those a little bit more condensed conversations. So. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, when it comes to like any drama, I mean, it's easy to get through at least for like a half hour or an hour or so, because like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can talk because there's like, it's not like the big franchise or anything where you can just sit there for two hours straight and just have a good geeking out conversation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, it is. Yeah. It, it's, Man, there, there's so much, you know, to this world. Uh, we don't talk about the uh, Fantastic Beast movies on this podcast, so because <laughs> it does because it doesn't exist. Nope, it doesn't exist. Well, yeah, it's, it's I don't. <laughs> uh, it's like they're they're really pushing this franchise. <laughs> like I know, is they are still continuing to have J.K. Rowling being the screenwriter, which I think it was a huge mistake on their part because look, it's a it's so much different 
writing a book than doing a screenplay. Yeah. They're two different things. Oh, yeah. And vice versa. A screenplay that's person the problem. Cannot... My, my, biggest con- my biggest complaint about the first two Fantastic Beasts is that it lacks of heart. There's a lot of boring characters and the story's all over the place and it didn't know what it wanted to be. And there's too much information that we cannot follow or, or keep mm-hmm. track. Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. It's crazy yeah. stuff. Um, let's actually close out here. Like I said, um, you know, it's great having you guys back on. Yeah, it's great to be here, man. You know, uh, we got to find, you know, love to have, have you guys on for like one of the finales for either part one or part two. We're mm-hmm. definitely hallows. Um, so we'll go around the uh, show really quick. We'll start with JD. Let everyone know where they can find you on the internet and what is coming up on your podcast and the websites. Uh, yeah, so you can find everything we do at InSessionFilm.com. So we have we have two podcasts. We have uh, our main show that comes out on Tuesdays. Uh, we have extra film that comes out on Fridays slash Saturdays, depending on when I can get to the editing of that. But uh, that's uh, the show. With, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> not necessarily, I don't mind it as much as I used to, yeah, but it, at the end of the day, it is editing. <laughs> uh, but we have those two shows. We also have an Oscars podcast. Uh, chasing the gold that comes out uh, uh, occasionally throughout the year, frequently more so this time of year. Um, and if we have re- reviews on the website as well, including uh, a couple from Mr. Christian over there himself. Uh, I believe you have one recently for The Harder They Fall, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Great movie. Everyone should go watch it. It's on Netflix. Yeah. You have no excuse. No. <laughs> yep. And of course, you can read his thoughts in our review at InSessionFilm.com. So yeah, you can find links to the podcast, uh, to everything that we have coming up there. We have a very long review of Eternals up there <laughs> that we did recently <laughs> as well. Uh, coming up on the show, uh, the next episode we'll have by the time this show comes out, I believe we are reviewing Kenneth Branagh's Belfast, yes. which, oh, oh it's so good. Spoiler alert. I loved it. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> it's I, so good. Oh, it's I, so, can't, so I can't good. wait to see it this weekend. I, yeah. <laughs> Cause everybody's phrasing about it and I raving about it and I can't wait. Yeah. I would urge everyone to go see Belfast. If it's if playing can. in your area, yeah. definitely. Cause I know in some yeah. areas, unfortunately it just isn't, which is an issue, sure. but yeah. Yeah, but it's supposed to come. It, it's supposed to come out like everywhere this weekend. Hopefully, yeah. okay, yeah. Hopefully, so, I'm hoping so. Yeah, I do urge people to go see it. But again, everything we do, one place in sessionfilm.com. And thanks again for having me, Christian. This was a ton of fun. Oh, no problem. And of course, you know, all that information will be in the show notes uh, where you can find JD uh, in Session Film Twitter account and uh, the website as mm-hmm. well. So I'll pass it over here to Matt to let everyone know where you, they can find you on the internet. Yeah, again, Christian, thank you so much for letting me come on this show, even though I wasn't intended to, to come on in the first place. But thank you so much for reaching out to me. And I'm open to come back again and again. Even if it's not Harry Potter, I'm still open to come to talk about more things, even TV shows or movies. So if you mm-hmm. want to find me on my social media, you just go to my Twitter, uh, go to my Twitter that says at Matt Wyatt 651 and go to my a bio where it says Linktree, where I have Snapchat, uh, Instagram, and Letterbox, where I do my movie reviews on there. And if you want to check out my recent review, I did a lot of reviews for new recent movies: The Heart of the Fall, Spencer, mm-hmm. and, um, and and the Internals. And if you and, the Internals, um, and definitely the, no, the Internals. <laughs> It's been a long there's night. There's the Eternals. Yeah, there's been a long night. night. <laughs> and dude, this was a lot of fun talking about the Harry Potter. I mean, we went on for almost an hour and a half. And so if you want to follow these two guys on the show, follow JD and Christian. They're awesome people to talk Thank to. I, I had a lot of blast. It. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for the yeah, kind I appreciate words. that. It's, oh, man, oh, man. I Every time I talk about I I just love Order of the Phoenix so much. It's like. You know, like you, you get it. Just, yeah, you know, it's the nice build up to Goblet of Fire. Goblet of Fire is great. I mean, Azkaban is fantastic as well. But it's like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. like or the Phoenix is up next. Like hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> like one hundred percent. That's how I feel. <laughs> it's just so. It's like, it's like, oh, it's so magical. And I, but I, I love the score. Like I, I have the the vinyl record of like some some of the Harry Potter movies. One of them being um, Azkaban and Order of Phoenix. So it's like just listening to it mm. on vinyl. It's like, 
Yeah, I love it. Like yeah. I, I, I do. Stuff. I do truly do love the Order of Phoenix. I wouldn't say it's my favorite of the series. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mentioned this before in the previous episode that Prisoner of Azkaban is still my favorite of the of the Harry Potter Azkaban franchise, is which is fair. Fantastic. Yeah, that's top three for me. Even yeah. though most mm-hmm. people would agree, I mean, I, I don't blame them. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I wish that more people liked Order of the Phoenix because it's such an underrated film. I do mm-hmm. too, man. It's like I don't yeah. understand where the hate came from, and. I mean, you know, we're we're gonna be reviewing Hat Blood Prince here this weekend, do a little batch recording because there's a lot of to get through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so patience. It's patience, my young Padawan. But yeah, my young um, Padawan. So of course, you know, you can find us here on the Film Optics uh podcast. Um, you know, we're audio only. Um, so don't go looking on YouTube, even though there is a film optics on there. It is us, but from a different time. We do not upload there anymore as i've said in the past so um by the time this is out um of course we have our eternals review that you can definitely check out the me and Devin uh dug into that film and as well as our previous you know our last night in soho review is up and you know our other harry potter uh, movie series reviews um have been coming on a weekly basis so yeah you got some catching up to do if you haven't listened out there and coming up on the podcast of course we have things like Ghostbusters Afterlife, Tick Tick Boom, um, Not Red Notice, Belfast, if if it's playing in Devin's area. And I think we're going to try to tackle Spencer as well. It really just depends. But we will also have our uh, The Harder They Fall review that we'll be dropping on Thursday. Because this, by the time of this recording, it'll be out. No. Oh, my God. Friday. Yeah, sorry. The Heart of the Day Falls coming out Friday. This will be dropping out on Thursday, uh, November 11th, a.k.a. Skyrim Anniversary Day, everybody. Let's go. And we're like one or two days away from Disney Plus Day. So that'll be a lot of fun. So I'm very, very excited for all that. And of course, you know, you can listen to us on podcast platforms around the internet. And you can follow us on social media, on Twitter and Instagram at film optics i actually wanted to ask you guys did you know you, you we've all heard of imdb have you heard yeah. of tmdb no mm, i don't, think, I don't so. think i have so it's called the movie database <laughs> if you go on <laughs> letterbox and you click on like this like uh, so i did it for um for like for any movie like at the very like bottom where it shows like the runtime and it says more IMDb, and then next to it, it says TMDB. <laughs> it hmm. stands for the movie database. Okay. Never heard of this place a day in my life. <laughs> and I was like, what? No. Like, it's, it is, I mean, it's, I guess you could call it, it's like IMDB light in a way, but like, it's, it's got like, you know, all the information there. Um, there's hmm. more, um, the reviews are more so like comments, and there's like discussions oh, and gotcha. stuff. So, yeah, I didn't know about it until earlier. Like, yeah, the movie database. I think it should have been called something yeah. different, but it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the internet's all about copying each other. That's, I mean, that's yeah, what honestly, like, there's seldom, like, ideas out there. But it's like, hey, you know, how many yeah. podcasts have the word, like, film or, like, geek or nerd in it? So it's, yeah. it, it's, so, it's so difficult to come up with an original name when you're doing a podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. it sucks coming up with a name. Actually, <laughs> it's like, what can we come up with that no hasn't been taken yet? Like, I mean, we have another podcast. Like, That's good, but it's been taken. Yeah, well, like we have another yeah. podcast called like Critics Play Games, but it's more so focused more on the YouTube side. So if anyone wants to go over there and check it out, we do a lot of uh, YouTube reviews over there. More so, my friend Zach does, but I try to take care of the podcast side. But yeah, it's it's hard to come up with a name, like because. You want something that sticks or rolls off the tongue really nicely. Honestly, I don't know how the heck it came up with this name. So it is what it is. We're kind of stuck with it. So, <laughs> but, but uh, let's uh, close out here. And again, thank you guys so much for coming on. Uh, keep doing what you guys are doing. You know, you guys are, you know, a huge part of the film community, at least to me. So, you know, I always mm. enjoyed checking out your guys' content and, we're almost to the end of the year, guys. We're we're almost yeah. there. We're Getting almost close. Yeah, but twenty 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 one came went by so quickly. It's uh man. I'm just it did. Yeah. It's so I, I feel like it should still be twenty nineteen right now, to be honest. Like 
<laughs> I mean, th- there, there's another timeline where I was supposed to go see a quiet place part two on time. I was literally like a week away. <laughs> I was like, we got to see onward, you know, with Chris Pratt yeah. and then Tom Holland. Now we get to go see a quiet place part two. I had like a double. And then it never thing. came. It, it, never it never came. came. <laughs> literally because during the pandemic, but I mean, before the pandemic, the last movie I saw in a theater before it was shut down, it was onward. It was literally onward. Mm. What was yours, JD? Really quick before we got out of here. Mine was the Ben Affleck basketball. Oh, movie. the way back. I the love back. that movie. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, very I good. enjoyed it. Very yeah, that very was the last good. one I saw. And unfortunately, yeah, I, there's I, a lot I bought, of people. I bought that when it came out on VOD during the pandemic. Very mm. good stuff. And unfortunately, yeah, there's a lot of people. I enjoyed it. Uh, movie yeah. out there that was um what was that? Not red notice. The one with uh with uh Vin Diesel, that oh. that super weird comic book movie. <laughs> oh yeah, um, I think it, Blood Spot. Blood Spot. Oh, yeah, Blood yeah Spot. I watched Blood that. It was Blood it was so whatever. bad. I mean, this was during the time when the, the theaters were shut down and they were putting out the the home releases theater at home. Yeah, yeah. Right now we had to watch it at home. Yeah. But yeah, it is what it is. So let's get out of here. I know I don't want to take up your guys' this evening too much. So that is a wrap for today, everyone. Thank you all for listening. And if you enjoy the show, leave us a five-star rating review on Apple Podcasts. And follow us on Twitter to stay in the know. That was Matt, JD. My name is Christian. We'll see you guys in the next one.